story two of the bet and other stories by anton chekhov this librivox recording is in the public domain story two a tedious story from an old man's journal part one there lives in russia an emeritus professor nikolai stepanovich privy councillor and knight he has so many russian and foreign orders that when he puts them on the students call him the holy picture his acquaintance is most distinguished not a single famous scholar lived or died during the last twenty-five or thirty years but he was intimately acquainted with him now he has no one to be friendly with but speaking of the past the long list of his eminent friends would end with such names as pirogov kavalin and the poet nekrasov who bestowed upon him their warmest and most sincere friendship he is a member of all the russian and of three foreign universities etc etc all this and a great deal besides forms what is known as my name this name of mine is very popular it is known to every literate person in russia abroad it is mentioned from professorial chairs with the epithets eminent and esteemed it is reckoned among those fortunate names which to mention in vain or to abuse in public or in the press is considered a mark of bad breeding indeed it should be so because with my name is inseparably associated the idea of a famous richly gifted and indubitably useful person i am a steady worker with the endurance of a camel which is important i am also endowed with talent which is still more important in passing i would add that i am a well-educated modest and honest fellow i have never poked my nose into letters or politics never sought popularity in disputes with the ignorant and made no speeches either at dinners or at my colleagues funerals altogether there is not a single spot on my learned name and it has nothing to complain of it is fortunate the bearer of this name that is myself is a man of sixty-two with a bald head false teeth and an incurable tick my name is as brilliant and prepossessing as i myself am dull and ugly my head and hands tremble from weakness my neck like that of one of Turgenev's heroines resembles the handle of a counter-base my chest is hollow and my back narrow when i speak or read my mouth twists and when i smile my whole face is covered with senile deathly wrinkles there is nothing imposing in my pitiable face save that when i suffer from the tick i have a singular expression which compels any one who looks at me to think this man will die soon for sure i can still read pretty well i can still hold the attention of my audience for two hours my passionate manner the literary form of my exposition and my humour make the defects of my voice almost unnoticeable though it is dry harsh and hard like a hypocrite's but i write badly the part of my brain which governs the ability to write refused office my memory has weakened and my thoughts are too inconsequent and when i expound them on paper i always have a feeling that i have lost the sense of their organic connection the construction is monotonous and the sentence feeble and timid i often do not write what i want to and when i write the end i cannot remember the beginning i often forget common words and in writing a letter i always have to waste much energy in order to avoid superfluous sentences and unnecessary incidental statements both bear clear witness of the decay of my intellectual activity and it is remarkable that the simpler the letter the more tormenting is my effort when writing a scientific article i feel much freer and much more intelligent than in writing a letter of welcome or a report one thing more it is easier for me to write german or english than russian as regards my present life i must first of all note insomnia from which i have begun to suffer lately 
if i were asked what is now the chief and fundamental fact of your existence i would answer insomnia from habit i still undress at midnight precisely and get into bed i soon fall asleep but awake just after one with the feeling that i have not slept at all i must get out of bed and light the lamp for an hour or two i walk about the room from corner to corner and inspect the long familiar pictures when i am weary of walking i sit down to the table i sit motionless thinking of nothing feeling no desires if a book lies before me i draw it mechanically towards me and read without interest thus lately in one night i read mechanically a whole novel with a strange title of what the swallow sang or in order to occupy my attention i make myself count to a thousand or i imagine the face of some one of my friends and begin to remember in what year and under what circumstances he joined the faculty i love to listen to sounds now two rooms away from me my daughter liza will say something quickly in her sleep then my wife will walk through the drawing-room with a candle and infallibly drop the box of matches then the shrinking wood of the cupboard squeaks or the burner of the lamp tinkles suddenly and all these sounds somehow agitate me not to sleep of nights confesses one abnormal and therefore i wait impatiently for the morning and the day when i have the right not to sleep many oppressive hours pass before the cock crows he is my harbinger of good as soon as he has crowed i know that in an hour's time the porter downstairs will awake and for some reason or other go up the stairs coughing angrily and later beyond the windows the air begins to pale gradually and voices echo in the street the day begins with the coming of my wife she comes in to me in a petticoat with her hair undone but already washed and smelling of eau de cologne and looking as though she came in by accident saying the same thing every time pardon i came in for a moment you haven't slept again then she puts the lamp out sits by the table and begins to talk i am not a prophet but i know beforehand what the subject of conversation will be every morning the same usually after breathless inquiries after my health she suddenly remembers our son the officer who was serving in warsaw on the twentieth of each month we send him fifty roubles this is our chief subject of conversation of course it is hard on us my wife sighs but until he is finally settled we are obliged to help him the boy is among strangers the pay is small but if you like next month we'll send him forty roubles instead of fifty what do you think daily experience might have convinced my wife that expenses do not grow less by talking of them but my wife does not acknowledge experience and speaks about our officer punctually every day about bread thank heaven being cheaper and sugar a halfpenny dearer and all this in a tone as though it were news to me i listen and agree mechanically probably because i have not slept during the night strange idle thoughts take hold of me i look at my wife and wonder like a child in perplexity i ask myself this old stout clumsy woman with sordid cares and anxiety about bread and butter written in the dull expression of her face her eyes tired with eternal thoughts of debts and poverty who can talk only of expenses and smile only when things are cheap this was once the slim varya whom i loved passionately for her fine clear mind her pure soul her beauty and as othello loved desdemona for her compassion of my science is she really the same my wife varya who bore me a son i gaze intently into the fat clumsy old woman's face i seek in her my varya but from the past nothing remains but her fear for my health and her way of calling my salary our salary and my hat our hat it pains me to look at her 
and to console her if only a little i let her talk as she pleases and i am silent even when she judges people unjustly or scolds me because i do not practise and do not publish textbooks our conversation always ends in the same way my wife suddenly remembers that i have not yet had tea and gives a start why am i sitting down she says getting up the samovar has been on the table a long while and i am chatting how forgetful i am good gracious she hurries away but stops at the door to say we owe yegor five months wages do you realize it it's a bad thing to let the servants wages run on i've said so often it's much easier to pay ten roubles every month than fifty for five outside the door she stops again i pity our poor liza more than anybody the girl studies at the conservatoire she's always in good society and the lord only knows how she's dressed that fur coat of hers it's a sin to show yourself in the street in it if she had a different father it would do but every one knows he is a famous professor a privy councillor so having reproached me for my name and title she goes away at last thus begins my day it does not improve when i have drunk my tea liza comes in in a fur coat and hat with her music ready to go to the conservatoire she is twenty-two she looks younger she is pretty rather like my wife when she was young she kisses me tenderly on my forehead and my hand good morning papa quite well as a child she adored ice cream and i often had to take her to a confectioner's ice cream was her standard of beauty if she wanted to praise me she used to say papa you are ice creamy one finger she called the pistachio the other the cream the third the raspberry finger and so on and when she came to say good morning i used to lift her on to my knees and kiss her fingers and say the cream one the pistachio one the lemon one and now from force of habit i kiss liza's fingers and murmur pistachio one cream one lemon one but it does not sound the same i am cold like the ice cream and i feel ashamed when my daughter comes in and touches my forehead with her lips i shudder as though a bee had stung my forehead i smile constrainedly and turn away my face since my insomnia began a question has been driving like a nail into my brain my daughter continually sees how terribly i an old man blush because i owe the servant his wages she sees how often the worry of small debts forces me to leave my work and to pace the room from corner to corner for hours thinking but why hasn't she even once come to me without telling her mother and whispered father here's my watch bracelets earrings dresses pawn them all you need money why seeing how i and her mother try to hide our poverty out of false pride why does she not deny herself the luxury of music lessons i would not accept the watch the bracelets or her sacrifices god forbid i do not want that which reminds me of my son the warsaw officer he is a clever honest and sober fellow but that doesn't mean very much if i had an old father and i knew that there were moments when he was ashamed of his poverty i think i would give up my commission to someone else and hire myself out as a navvy these thoughts of the children poison me what good are they only a mean and irritable person can take refuge in thinking evil of ordinary people because they are not heroes but enough of that at a quarter to ten i have to go and lecture to my dear boys i dress myself and walk the road i have known these thirty years for me it has a history of its own here is a big grey building with a chemist shop beneath a tiny house once stood there and it was a beer shop in this beer shop i thought out my thesis and wrote my first love letter to varya 
i wrote it in pencil on a scrap of paper that began historia morbi here is a grocer's shop it used to belong to a little jew who sold me cigarettes on credit and later on to a fat woman who loved students because every one of them had a mother now a red-headed merchant sits there a very nonchalant man who drinks tea from a copper teapot and here are the gloomy gates of the university that have not been repaired for years a weary porter in a sheepskin coat a broom heaps of snow such gates cannot produce a good impression on a boy who comes fresh from the provinces and imagines that the temple of science is really a temple certainly in the history of russian pessimism the age of university buildings the dreariness of the corridors the smoke stains on the walls the meagre light the dismal appearance of the stairs the clothes pegs and the benches hold one of the foremost places in the series of predisposing causes here is our garden it does not seem to have grown any better or any worse since i was a student i do not like it it would be much more sensible if tall pine trees and fine oaks grew there instead of consumptive lime trees yellow acacias and thin-clipped lilac the student's mood is created mainly by every one of the surroundings in which he studies therefore he must see everywhere before him only what is great and strong and exquisite heaven preserve him from starveling trees broken windows and drab walls and doors covered with tom oilcloth as i approach my main staircase the door is open wide i am met by my old friend of the same age and name as i nicholas the porter he grunts as he lets me in it's frosty your excellency or if my coat is wet it's raining a bit your excellency then he runs in front of me and opens all the doors on my way in the study he carefully takes off my coat and at the same time manages to tell me some university news because of the close acquaintance that exists between all the university porters and keepers he knows all that happens in the four faculties in the registry in the chancellor's cabinet and the library he knows everything when for instance the resignation of the rector or dean is under discussion i hear him talking to the junior porters naming candidates and explaining offhand that so-and-so will not be approved by the minister so-and-so will himself refuse the honour then he plunges into fantastic details of some mysterious papers received in the registry of a secret conversation which appears to have taken place between the minister and the curator and so on these details apart he is almost always right the impressions he forms of each candidate are original but also true if you want to know who read his thesis join the staff resigned or died in a particular year then you must seek the assistance of this veteran's colossal memory he will not only name you the year month and day but give you the accompanying details of this or any other event such memory is the privilege of love he is the guardian of the university traditions from the porters before him he inherited many legends of the life of the university he added to this wealth some of his own and if you like he will tell you many stories long or short he can tell you of extraordinary savants who knew everything of remarkable scholars who did not sleep for weeks on end of numberless martyrs to science good triumphs over evil with him the weak always conquer the strong the wise man the fool the modest the proud the young the old there is no need to take all these legends and stories for sterling but filter them and you will find what you want in your filter a noble tradition and the names of true heroes acknowledged by all 
in our society all the information about the learned world consists entirely of anecdotes of the extraordinary absent-mindedness of old professors and of a handful of jokes which are ascribed to goober or to myself or to babuchan but this is too little for an educated society if it loved science savants and students as nicholas loves them it would long ago have had a literature of whole epics stories and biographies but unfortunately this is yet to be the news told nicholas looks stern and we begin to talk business if an outsider were then to hear how freely nicholas uses the jargon he would be inclined to think that he was a scholar posing as a soldier by the way the rumors of the university porter's erudition are very exaggerated it is true that nicholas knows more than a hundred latin tags can put a skeleton together and on occasion make a preparation can make the students laugh with a long learned quotation but the simple theory of the circulation of the blood is as dark to him now as it was twenty years ago at the table in my room bent low over a book or a preparation sits my dissector peter ignatievich he is a hard-working modest man of thirty-five without any gifts already bald and with a big belly he works from morning to night reads tremendously and remembers everything he has read in this respect he is not merely an excellent man but a man of gold and in all others he is a cart-horse or if you like a learned blockhead the characteristic traits of a cart-horse which distinguish him from a creature of talent are these his outlook is narrow absolutely bounded by his specialism apart from his own subject he is as naive as a child i remember once entering the room and saying think what bad luck they say skobilev is dead nicholas crossed himself but peter ignatievich turned to me which skobilev do you mean another time some time earlier i announced that professor pirov is dead that darling peter ignatievich asked what was his subject i imagine that if patty sang into his ear or russia were attacked by hordes of chinamen or there was an earthquake he would not lift a finger but would go on in the quietest way with his eye screwed over his microscope in a word what's hecuba to him i would give anything to see how this dry old stick goes to bed with his wife another trait a fanatical belief in the infallibility of science above all in everything that the germans write he is sure of himself and his preparations knows the purpose of life is absolutely ignorant of the doubts and disillusionments that turn talents gray a slavish worship of the authorities and not a shadow of need to think for himself it is hard to persuade him and quite impossible to discuss with him just try a discussion with a man who is profoundly convinced that the best science is medicine the best men doctors the best traditions the medical from the ugly past of medicine only one tradition has survived the white necktie that doctors wear still for a learned and more generally for an educated person there can exist only a general university tradition without any division into traditions of medicine of law and so on but it's quite impossible for peter ignatievich to agree with that and he is ready to argue it with you till doomsday his future is quite plain to me during the whole of his life he will make several hundred preparations of extraordinary purity will write any number of dry quite competent essays will make about ten scrupulously accurate translations but he won't invent gunpowder for gunpowder imagination is wanted inventiveness and a gift for divination and peter ignatievich has nothing of the kind in short he is not a master of science but a laborer peter ignatievich nicholas and i whisper together we are rather strange to ourselves 
one feels somewhat quite particular when the audience booms like the sea behind the door in thirty years i have not grown used to this feeling and i have it every morning i button up my frock coat nervously ask nicholas unnecessary questions get angry it is as though i were afraid but it is not fear but something else which i cannot name nor describe unnecessarily i look at my watch and say well it's time to go and we march in in this order nicholas with the preparations or the atlases in front myself next and after me the cart horse modestly hanging his head or if necessary a corpse on a stretcher in front and behind the corpse nicholas and so on the students rise when i appear then sit down and the noise of the sea is suddenly still calm begins i know what i will lecture about but i know nothing of how i will lecture where i will begin and where i will end there is not a single sentence ready in my brain but as soon as i glance at the audience sitting around me in an amphitheatre and utter the stereotyped in our last lecture we ended with and the sentences fly out of my soul in a long line then it is full steam ahead i speak with irresistible speed and with passion and it seems as though no earthly power could check the current of my speech in order to lecture well that is without being wearisome and to the listener's profit besides talent you must have the knack of it and experience you must have a clear idea both of your own powers of the people to whom you are lecturing and of the subject of your remarks moreover you must be quick in the uptake keep a sharp eye open and never for a moment lose your field of vision when he presents the composer's thought a good conductor does twenty things at once he reads the score waves his baton watches the singer makes a gesture now towards the drum now to the double bass and so on it is the same with me when lecturing i have some hundred and fifty faces before me quite unlike each other and three hundred eyes staring me straight in the face my purpose is to conquer this many-headed hydra if i have a clear idea how far they are attending and how much they are comprehending every minute while i am lecturing then the hydra is in my power my other opponent is within me this is the endless variety of forms phenomena and laws and the vast number of ideas whether my own or others which depend upon them every moment i must be skilful enough to choose what is most important and necessary from this enormous material and just as swiftly as my speech flows to clothe my thought in a form which will penetrate the hydra's understanding and excite its attention besides i must watch carefully to see that my thoughts shall not be presented as they have been accumulated but in a certain order necessary for the correct composition of the picture which i wish to paint further i endeavour to make my speech literary my definitions brief and exact my sentences as simple and elegant as possible every moment i must hold myself in and remember that i have only an hour and forty minutes to spend in other words it is a heavy labour at one and the same time you have to be a savant a schoolmaster and an orator and it is a failure if the orator triumphs over the schoolmaster in you or the schoolmaster over the orator after lecturing for a quarter for a half hour i notice suddenly that the students have begun to stare at the ceiling or peter ignatievich one will feel for his handkerchief another settle himself comfortably another smile at his own thoughts this means their attention is tried i must take steps i seize the first opening and make a pun all the hundred and fifty faces have a broad smile their eyes flash merrily and for a while you can hear the boom of the sea i laugh too their attention is refreshed and i can go on 
no sport no recreation no game ever gave me such delight as reading a lecture only in a lecture could i surrender myself wholly to passion and understand that inspiration is not a poet's fiction but exists indeed and i do not believe that hercules even after the most delightful of his exploits felt such a pleasant weariness as i experienced every time after a lecture this was in the past now at lectures i experience only torture not half an hour passes before i begin to feel an invincible weakness in my legs and shoulders i sit down in my chair but i am not used to lecture sitting in a moment i am up again and lecture standing then i sit down again inside my mouth is dry my voice is hoarse my head feels dizzy to hide my state from my audience i drink some water now and then cough wipe my nose continually as though i was troubled by a cold make inopportune puns and finally announce the interval earlier than i should but chiefly i feel ashamed conscience and reason tell me that the best thing i could do now is to read my farewell lecture to the boys give them my last word bless them and give up my place to someone younger and stronger than i but heaven be my judge i have not the courage to act up to my conscience unfortunately i am neither philosopher nor theologian i know quite well i have no more than six months to live and it would seem that now i ought to be mainly occupied with questions of the darkness beyond the grave and the visions which will visit my sleep in the earth but somehow my soul is not curious of these questions though my mind grants every atom of their importance now before my death it is just as it was twenty or thirty years ago only science interests me when i take my last breath i shall still believe that science is the most important the most beautiful the most necessary thing in the life of man that she has always been and always will be the highest manifestation of love and that by her alone will man triumph over nature and himself this faith is perhaps at bottom naive and unfair but i am not to blame if this and not another is my faith to conquer this faith within me is for me impossible but this is beside the point i only ask that you should incline to my weakness and understand that to tear a man who is more deeply concerned with the destiny of a brain tissue than the final goal of creation away from his rostrum and his students is like taking him and nailing him up in a coffin without waiting until he is dead because of my insomnia and the intense struggle with my increasing weakness a strange thing happens inside me in the middle of my lecture tears rise to my throat my eyes begin to ache and i have a passionate and hysterical desire to stretch out my hands and moan aloud i want to cry out that fate has doomed me a famous man to death that in some six months here in the auditorium another will be master i want to cry out that i am poisoned that new ideas that i did not know before have poisoned the last days of my life and sting my brain incessantly like mosquitoes at that moment my position seems so terrible to me that i want all my students to be terrified to jump from their seats and rush panic-stricken to the door shrieking in despair it is not easy to live through such moments end of story two part one